It's no secret that in this day and age, it's basically a requirement to have your digital life backed up from personal files, photos, computers, passwords, basically anything made out of ones and zeros. The real question is how? Do you pay a couple of big companies a subscription to host it for you, or do you just do it yourself? Honestly, you could make a point for either, but in this video, I'm gonna show you how to create your own personal cloud that will allow you to consolidate all of your cloud backups into a single device that's affordable and lives under your own roof. So I'm not gonna talk about too much of the why aspect here. Everyone has a different reason as to why they wanna host their own cloud, whether that's for cost, security, privacy, convenience, or some combination of these. If you're watching this video, you probably just care about the how aspect of it. So here we go. Let's start with what we are going to need. A computer, storage, an internet connection, and a domain name, that's it. The computer you choose does not need to be anything crazy. Most people are gonna go with mini PCs these days due to their size and power efficiency. So realistically, you could just pick up something that can fit the amount of storage you need. And that amount of storage that you need greatly depends on how many devices or files you're looking to back up. For beginners and basic small setups, two mirrored hard drives would be a good start. I'd say for most people, a good rule of thumb is a minimum of one terabyte per person per device. So for example, if I'm looking to back up my wife and I's computers and phones, I'd probably want a minimum of four terabytes of space. To get four terabytes of usable space, that would mean we should get two four terabyte drives since for two drives, we'd set them up in RAID 1, which mirrors all of the data for redundancy. If you have space for more drives though, you could do something like RAID 5 with four two terabyte drives, which nets you about six terabytes of usable space with a single drive worth of redundancy. Again, this is just a rule of thumb, so if you need more, just get higher capacity drives or more of them. An easy solution as well is to get a DAS, or Direct Attached Storage Device, which takes a number of hard drives and allows you to connect them to a computer via USB. Super easy. The computer could even be a tiny PC or a Raspberry Pi. For funsies, I'm going with my custom 2U system with a tri-mode backplane. Go watch that video if you want to see more about this, but I'll be using three of these 2 terabyte SATA SSDs and two of these one terabyte U.3 drives. The types of drives really don't matter for this video. In reality, you'll probably be using hard drives, but everything in terms of basic setup is the same. And once we have our machine, we have to choose a software. And there are many, many choices out there with varying levels of complexity and features. But for the most part, the big ones that you're gonna see in the self-hosting community are TrueNAS, Unraid, and Casa OS. And yes, I know, I probably left off your favorite one and you're seething in the comments right now, relax. I listed these specifically because they provide an easy way to manage both your storage and your apps. And I've done quite a few videos on each of these, but for today's video, I think we're gonna go with TrueNAS. To get this installed, we'll need a dedicated boot drive, so make sure you have some kind of drive, preferably an SSD dedicated for installing ROS. I'm just using a regular NVMe drive for this. Installing TrueNAS is generally the same as installing most operating systems. Download the ISO file, create a bootable USB drive using Etcher, plug that into our machine, and boot from that by accessing the boot menu or BIOS. Go ahead through the setup process and configure the system as you see fit. In general, the default options are usually good enough and can be changed later if necessary. Once this is complete, we should be given an IP address on the screen and navigating to that IP address in the browser of any PC on the same network will allow us to access our server. Neat. And this is the TrueNAS dashboard. There's lots of useful information here, but none of that really matters until we actually create some data pools. So let's do that. For my pool, that will be using my three drives. It makes sense that we go with a RAID Z1 type, which means you get one drive worth of fault tolerance. We also have RAID Z2 and RAID Z3 with two and three drives worth of tolerance respectively. For our setup, this gives us roughly four terabytes of usable space. All of these options are ZFS features like caching and metadata storage, which can be very beneficial, but this isn't really a ZFS video. So go watch a Tom Lawrence video or something if you want more information on that. We are just gonna set up a pretty basic pool here. We're gonna do a similar thing also with our two one terabyte drives, except this time we will choose mirror which mirrors the data for both drives, effectively cutting your usable space in half, but giving you a single drive worth of redundancy. At this point, we have our pools. Now it's time to create some shared folders so that we can access this storage from any computer in our network, because what's the point of having all of this if nothing can access it? First off, let's create a user that we'll use to access our network share. 
The only really important thing here is to ensure that the SMB user box is checked at the very bottom. This will make sure that the user is created properly to access that network share. Now, probably gave away what kind of share we are creating, and you generally have three options, SMB, NFS, or iSCSI. Most of the time, including this one, we will go with SMB because it's compatible with Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. We are gonna go ahead and select a path, and in this case, that will be our big boy pool. And then we are going to create a data set in here just for our share. After that, we will need to ensure that our user from before can access it, so we'll go into the file system ACL and add the user to the list. You could also create a group to handle these permissions that way, but since we only made one user, then this is fine. Then after a restart, we should be good to go. From my Windows machine, I can navigate to the IP address of the server, then the name of the share, and with my credentials I created before, we're in. But what do we actually use this for? Well, this is going to be pivotal when backing up our computers because every OS has some kind of built-in backup system that will allow you to utilize a network share. In Windows, it's in the control panel and it's called Windows Backup and Restore uh, Windows 7. Dude, I, I don't know, don't ask me. But it's actually pretty nice to use as you can specify the same network path from before and give it our user and it'll back up straight to our network share. I did create a specific folder just to keep things organized, but once we select what we want backed up and how often we want it backed up, Windows will do the rest. It's actually pretty awesome. Mac OS and most Linux distros have pretty similar systems for this, and since we used SMB as our network share, all of them will be able to use it. So now that our computers are backed up, how about our photos? And you're probably thinking, Brett, I just upload them to my computer, so now that should be backed up, right? Well, yeah, if you want to do it the hard way, we're going to set up a service that will automatically back up our photos directly from our phone and it'll work from anywhere in the world. Now, I know I just said uploading it to your computer is the hard way, but I kind of lied. Uh, this is probably the more difficult way in terms of setup, but once it's done, it's all automatic. So the first thing that we will need is a photo management app. I'm going to go with image as it's what I use personally and I think it's great. You can find this in the TrueNAS App Store, and after a few tweaks to the config, it'll be up and running. You'll want to first update your time zone and select whether or not you want the AI features. If you have a GPU or a powerful CPU that can handle it, then feel free to leave this, but I'm going to turn it off. Then create a password for your database and Redis. Under that, you'll see the user ID that the app will use. Make note of this as we are going to need it very soon. The next part is the most important. You see, when you create your first app, TrueNAS will ask you which storage pool you want to use for apps. And since we have two pools where Big Boy is our mass storage one, I went with our mirrored one. And when an app needs some storage or to create some kind of directories, it'll by default use that app pool. However, with this being a photo management app where we may be uploading a ton of photos, we actually want to utilize our Big Boy pool specifically. You'll see for the upload location, there is another option to specify a host path. Now we can go into Big Boy and create another data set specific for image. Unless you already did this before during testing and forgot to delete it. Now we are also going to want to set the ACL on this data set and here is where we use that user ID from before. We want to ensure that that user can access this data set. And this is the default internal user that TrueNAS creates for apps then everything else can be left default until the bottom where you can set the resources. I'm going with eight cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. So it'll very much depend on your hardware. Then go ahead and deploy it. After a minute or so, you should be able to access the image UI where you'll walk through the initial setup and be thrown into the dashboard where you can start uploading your photos from your computer or locally over your phone. However, I said this would work from anywhere in the world. And in general, there are two ways to do this. You can either host a VPN server in your network and connect to that VPN from any client device when you're away, or you can set up a reverse proxy that routes you in from a public domain. We're gonna go with this option. And I do have an entire video dedicated to doing this, but I'll try to cover it a bit quicker. The first thing you'll need is a domain name registered with Cloudflare. Cloudflare now gives you the ability to purchase one through them, but you can buy one from anywhere and then just transfer it over to Cloudflare if you want. But once you have that, you'll go into the DNS section and create a DNS A record that specifies the name you want to use and your public IP address. You can find your public IP by going to what's my IP or something similar. 
Note that you do need an actual public IP that is not CG natted or this will not work. I have another video on Cloudflare tunnels for that, but let's just keep going. So once this is set up, any traffic that tries to go through photos.mrballoonhands.com will be pushed to my home network. However, my network has no idea what to do with this or where to send it. And that's where a reverse proxy comes in. A reverse proxy takes incoming connections, reads them, then decides where to send them internally. For this, we are using Nginx Proxy Manager since it's easy to set up and works well with Cloudflare. This, again, will be installed via the TrueNAS App Store, and you can honestly leave all the settings default if you'd like. Once we go into the UI, you'll be asked to update the admin account, and you'll be plopped into a pretty basic looking dashboard. The first step here will be to create an SSL certificate since Cloudflare will be using HTTPS traffic and we want everything encrypted. Fortunately, this is a very easy process. First, tell it what domain you want to use for the cert. And we're using a wildcard cert on the Mr. Balloon Hands domain so that that cert will work with any other subdomains or apps we want to create. Then for the DNS challenge, just select Cloudflare and enter your API token. The API token can be created from the Cloudflare dashboard and you'll want to use the edit DNS template. And if you have multiple domains, you may want to limit this token to a single one. Obviously the one you're working with. Make sure to copy this to a safe place if you want to reuse it as this is the only time you'll be able to see the token string. After that, you're done. You'll then be able to create your first proxy connection. Just set the domain name, which in our case was photos.mrballoonhands.com, then specify where you want that traffic to be sent internally. This is easy as it's just the IP of our TrueNAS server and the port that image is running on. And since it's HTTP internally, we'll leave that checked. For image, we also want to enable WebSockets as it wouldn't work if I left this off. The last step is to ensure that it uses our SSL certificate we just created and check the force SSL box. Boom, we're done. Kind of, there is one final step. You see, now we have our domain routing to our home network and we have NPM routing to image, but we don't have anything telling our main home network gateway to route all the HTTPS traffic from Cloudflare to NPM. This can be done with a simple port forward. And it'll be different depending on what router you use, but the concept is that you'll want traffic coming in from the WAN on port 443 to forward to our TrueNAS server IP on the HTTPS port that NPM, NPM, NPM is using. In some cases, that's also 443, but if we look at our NPM app, we'll see that it's using 30022, so we'll use that. And now we are done. If everything is set up correctly, when I go to photos.mrballoonhands.com, we should be able to reach image, and we can. If you're seeing an error here, I'd suggest to check your ports and to make sure in Cloudflare you have the always used HTTPS and strict traffic control set. And if it's still not working, you may be CG natted. This all depends on your ISP. But since we can now access it via our domain from anywhere with an internet connection, that means that using the image app on our phone will be able to automatically back up any photos we take, no matter where we are. You can have it send all your photos or only certain albums or only favorites. And you can also set it to where it'll only upload via Wi-Fi connection so that you don't burn through your data plan. It's honestly really awesome and it's why I use it on my personal device. And at this point, we have our proper backup setup for our computers and our photos sitting in its own cloud. The hard part of this is done and now we're free to add to this setup. If you want a more robust file storage solution, then check out Nextcloud or File Browser. And since we already have our networking configured, the only requirement to have this cloud accessible would be to just create another proxy entry in NPM. I will say that you need to be careful as you never want to expose apps to the internet that don't need to be. If you're like me, when I started my home lab journey, you'll probably be thinking, gee, I'll just expose my TrueNAS and I'll be able to access it from anywhere. No, never do this. Never expose your host system or anything that can access it since you're creating an entry point into your entire server, which is not good. Funny story, I actually learned this the hard way as I was messing around just a few years ago and exposed my guacamole instance, which allows SSH and RDP connections to various machines in my network. Well, someone uh, got in and installed a crypto mining worm on my host machine, so that was pretty fun. All that just to say, be careful, and if you'd like to go the VPN route as it's more secure, feel free to do that. 
Now, I know this was kind of a long video and I know we only barely scratched the surface for self-hosting your own cloud, but I wanted to show you a solid way to get started that will work on pretty much any hardware. Now, the last thing I think we need to discuss here is cost. I would wager that cost and convenience are the two biggest factors when it comes to deciding to host your own cloud. Your biggest expense when doing it yourself is usually going to be your storage. Honestly, the actual computer you use can be a $100 Optiplex off Facebook Marketplace if you want, or it could be free if you're good with your hands. So let's take this example. Let's say you just need two terabytes of storage. Well, if we go with some of the popular cloud hosted options, we're looking at around $10 to $12 per month. Over the course of a year, that's about $130. Now let's say we spent $100 on a computer and $100 on a couple of two terabyte drives. Well, your self-hosted option pays for itself in just a little over a year. But how about if we need 12 terabytes? Well, let's do the same thing. At 12 terabytes, our computer with two 12 terabyte drives cost half the price of 12 terabytes in iCloud for a year. So obviously at scale, it is much cheaper to run your own system. And I know, like I mentioned in the beginning, there are benefits that come with paying for these big companies, and that's convenience. For the most part, you can be rest assured that your data is safe and always accessible. And when you do it yourself, that's on you. Hardware dies, internet goes out, well, have fun resolving that. And at the end of the day, it's just up to you and your wallet. So what do you think? Feeling confident about hosting your own cloud or did I scare you off? I know it can be intimidating, but if you're willing to give it a shot and learn as you go, I think it's a pretty rewarding experience. If you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe if you want to see more self-hosted content. I'm going to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my self-hosted storage that totally doesn't hack me and install crypto worms. Y'all are the best. If you're still watching, you're a Synology approved hard drive. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one. 